questions before they leave. So please start compile your questions. So I welcome the president of uh, Cape Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Ms. Jenny Maibo. My esteemed fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the problem of xenophobia is not only about South Africans disliking foreigners, being violent, aggressive towards foreigners. We believe it goes much deeper that, and if we are to deal with this successfully, with this explosive issue, we need to understand the underlying causes they are. The real reason, ladies and gentlemen, for this is that just like water flows downhill, they don't make for short people. Okay. Let me try this again. I'll start over. The problem of xenophobia is not about South Africans just disliking, being violent, aggressive towards foreigners. It goes much deeper than that. And if we are to deal with it successfully, with this explosive issue, we need to understand the underlying causes thereof. The real reason for this, ladies and gentlemen, is just like water flows downhill, people flow or migrate to more successful and prosperous countries or areas. This has happened down the centuries and will continue to do so. A few recent examples to illustrate the point, I've purposely chosen examples that don't come from Africa. During the Cold War, people risked their lives to flee from the poor and repressive East Germany to the free and prosperous West Germany. Mexican citizens are going to extreme measures to smuggle themselves into the United States. People from Eastern Europe are flocking to England in search of employment, social benefits, and prosperity. The situation has come so serious that some in the United Kingdom want the country to withdraw from the European Union so that it will be free to implement orderly immigration controls. Another example is the new wave of migrants that was mentioned earlier from Africa risking their lives in rickety boats, often death traps, in the hope of reaching Italy or Greece and then to slump into other European countries. It is important that we understand that the two magnetic poles of migration are failure and success, ladies and gentlemen. The push factor comes from failure, and it can take many forms, from natural disasters like drought, to governance failures, to leading to economic disasters. The pull factor comes from success. In the days of Madiba's government, South Africa was the flavor of the month, the land of milk and honey. The country prospered economically, and the pull of a new life in the Rainbow Nation saw people streaming over our borders. But things have changed, ladies and gentlemen. Our economy is struggling, as everyone is painfully aware that we can't even pr produce enough electricity to keep our industries going. Employment opportunities are diminishing at a drastic rate. The competition for employment is ever increasing. In spite of all this, South Africa is still attractive to people from countries such as Zimbabwe and Malawi, where conditions are much worse, much worse and often horrendous. We see the same picture in the north of the continent, where even the drowning of hundreds of migrants has not decreased the flow of people desperate for new opportunities. It is easy to understand the pool factor, but we need to pay a lot more attention, ladies and gentlemen, to the push factor. We have seriously, we have previously pointed out that one of the biggest push factors is governance failures in some of our neighboring countries. I must say that I'm delighted to see that the government is beginning to recognize this and that many of the answers to the problems do not necessarily only lie in South Africa. President Zuma put it very gently in his Freedom's Day speech when he said that all African countries needed to handle their citizens with care. 
Of course, the president went out of his way to ensure that he did not offend any of the other African leaders. This would not have been constructive. But at the same time, it is a problem that has to be dealt with firmly and in depth. Many or most of the migrants appear to come from Zimbabwe, a country that has been badly run, that inflation got out of control, and the country that had to abandon its own currency and use US dollars to restore some kind of financial stability. Election problems, ladies and gentlemen, violence, instability have been symptoms of deeper problems. Ill-conceived land reforms and policies which forced foreign companies to share their assets with local elite have undermined investment and economic growth leading to unemployment. This has been a big push factor from this country. But has President Zuma sat down with President Mugabe and his ministers to discuss the knock and effect of their poor governance? I don't know the answer to this question, but I should not have to ask the question, ladies and gentlemen. It should be the number one item on the agenda for the talks between our two countries, with the aim of being solution driven. Unfortunately, in truth, the mass migration from Zimbabwe has been a problem our government leaders have done their best to ignore. The migration has been disastrous for Zimbabwe. No country can afford to lose its educated and skilled people on the scale that we've seen in recent times. When a country loses the best products of its education system, it loses its future prospects. We have seen some disastrous governance failures in the rest of Africa. At present, the worst example would be Sudan, where there is virtually no government at all. The Sudan has oil and sufficient quantities to lift the country out of poverty, but it isn't happening for a variety of reasons that we do not need to go into right now, ladies and gentlemen. Somalia is another one. It's not much better. They are people, their people are enterprising and capable. And ask any local plaza, plaza shop owner will tell you. Why can they not succeed in their own country? Africa is a continent rich in resources. Imagine how prosperous it would be if people stopped exporting royalties earned from oil and diamonds and the proceeds of corruption to Swiss bank accounts and numbered accounts in the islands that specialized in secret banking. Imagine an Africa where this money was spent on the roads, bridges, power stations, schools, hospitals, and universities. This would certainly take much of the push out of migration. Unfortunately, there's not a great deal we can do about the push factors in other countries in the short term, ladies and gentlemen. What we can do is make a much better effort to manage the problem on and in our borders. Running countless advertisements featuring all sorts of famous people saying no to xenophobia will be of little help. They may create the impression of concern and show that government is trying to do something, but we have to deal with the real underlying problems. These problems start at our borders. They are not well controlled. In fact, they are known as porous borders. The illegals, as they are often called, have two ways to enter into the country. They just walk across the border in less populous areas or they pay bribes. Both of these problems have to be dealt with. Protecting our borders should be the job of the Defence Force and the police should concentrate on dealing with corruption. We are also missing a great opportunity for many of the legals and illegals are well qualified people who could make an important contribution to our economy. They could create jobs for others. People with degrees are working here as car guards and waiters. What a scandalous waste of good human resources. A great deal of education has been invested in them and wasted as they go about work that for which they are overqualified. If we had good border controls, we'd get information about immigrants, their qualifications and skills, 
and we could use this information and harness it to our benefit. Zimbabwe used to have a very good education system, an education system that performed much better than our present system. How many of these migrants are qualified maths teachers, welders, lab laboratory technicians, or carpenters? What irks us as business is the consistency, inconsistency, I beg your pardon, of getting visas and work permits for business people and experts from overseas who can make a great contribution to the likes of engineering, manufacturing, and education. It is a daunting and often impossible task. The controls are so strict and the delays are long and costly. While on the other hand, people stream over our borders day and night, and we do little about it. We are using up our energy on the wrong problem, ladies and gentlemen. We now have a situation where our tourism industry is threatened by rec the requirement that all tourists will have to apply in person in their countries of origin for their visas. No other country in the world does this. They simply connect, collect the biometric data on arrival at the airports in a smooth and efficient operation. Tourists arrive with money in their pockets and return air tickets, however we make life difficult and complicated for them. It appears that we go out of our way to restrict entry to our shores. Soon they will have to provide unabridged birth certificates for children. Who will be asking for the unabridged birth certificates or will we be asking for unabridged birth certificates at Bright Bridge border? What happens if the persons do not have an unabridged birth certificate after the grace period? The flow of tourists from two biggest growth markets, India and China, has dried up. Another two big hotels are being planned for Cape Town as we speak. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we going to fill them if our tourism numbers are drying up? Forgive me if you feel that I've wandered off the topic, but these are matters that we need to take a holistic view of all our immigration controls and the consequences thereof as this all impacts negatively on our economy. In a way, it can be seen that xenophobia is a problem that we created for ourselves and that one, we have failed to manage. We created firstly, ladies and gentlemen, by being more successful than some of our neighboring countries and for that we should never have to apologize. We also created the problem by importing hundreds of thousands of migrant labor workers to work on the mines. They sent money home to their relatives and this flow of money became very important to our neighboring countries. They depend on it. It has been happening for more than 150 years. And it is a pattern that is well established. It is not a practice of which we approve or that we would like to continue. But it is well managed, or it was well managed, and our border controls were good. We have a problem, and we will not solve it with slogans like, say no to xenophobia, as I mentioned. The challenge is to gain a deeper understanding of what is happening, why it is happening, and to develop an orderly and consistent immigration policy to manage our borders effectively and to speak to other African leaders about the push coming from their countries. This is a problem of pull and push, and we have to deal with both. We also need to remember that these are the countries that they were, was there for us in the times, dark times of apartheid. And what do we do to repay them? We have xenophobic actions. To end on a good note, however, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great step forward that attention is being drawn to this very sad and serious topic. Hopefully it will lead to much needed improvements to this challenging situation. I have no doubt that the solutions will take a long time to be developed, but we have by giving this matter the attention it deserves, taken a good step in the right direction. But we have to do so much more. I thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. We, we have to do so much more. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult when you have your president speaking and you, you just want, don't want to stop her. Jenny is actually my president. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, so we want to move uh, forward in this uh, particular event, but uh, I would just like to say this. I, I have a kind of a 
a small informational message to our distinguished audience from the community of foreign nationals. Some of them have been ably represented here by the leaders of their organizations. And the, the, the message is simple. They would like to keep this memory alive. So we, we are requesting that the representative have, has asked me to tell you that they will need a kind of a group uh, photograph with you before you leave so that we can, you know, begin to refresh our memories. And, uh, yeah, so I, I would just want uh, the, the leaders of the organiza of various organizations after the, the minister's speech to just go and see Mr. Ramadan uh, at the back. Mr. Ramadan is standing. So just to organize ourselves to have a good prof uh, photograph with our, our, our speakers. Yes, speaker. yes, so the group photograph is going to be up here. So we have the names of those leaders of organization. Everything is organized, so it's not going to be everybody, but uh, each organization have the uh, organization have the right to uh, have one representative to come up and then we take the group photograph. Thank you. Yes, we want to move forward now. And as I call on our next uh, distinguished speaker, um,